He said, you should make it clear that uh, we are in total agreement with Muslims. When you say God is one, we say the same thing, because that means there's only one God. That's what we believe, that's what you believe. So, I pointed out to him that Allahu Wahid, if you like to say God is one, can have a wide range of meanings and does. One of which he'd obviously overlooked, because the priest who'd just spoken before him had contradicted the the very point, that when you say something is one, you mean it is an undivided whole. It's completely what it is. As the example I gave, I said Einstein had said at one time, he said security is one. What he was getting at was it's rather meaningless to say, I am secure, except for that. That could be dangerous. Well, then you're not secure. You either are or you are not. Security is one. It doesn't come in pieces, so you can be 90%. You are secure or you are not secure. So when the Muslim says God is one, he means he is 100% godly. He's not divine and godly 99%, and there is this about him which is not exactly godly. No, God is one or he isn't God. Because the priest who had just spoken before him had pointed out that there is one God, and he's divine, but he is also something less than divine. He is man. That's not God, by definition. When I say God, I say Allah. He's one. He's 100% who he is. He's not, in part, something less than what he is. That's not God anymore. We're talking about something else. The Quran insists God has no offspring, whether adopted or begotten, for the simple reason that divinity... The quality of being godly is a quality that you don't achieve or produce by definition. You can't be something else and then get godliness. Or it can't be the case that there wasn't this godly item and then it was brought forward because what is divine is not produced. Who is divine didn't gain that position. Being divine, who is divine has always been divine. Now, when such things are discussed often, the usual response is, again, I'm saying the Muslim is on the defensive, people will say, yes, but you know, logic has its limits. That's an excuse that people use. It's true. Logic has its limits. It uh, shocked the uh, world of uh, uh, logic and uh, mathematicians in general. 1931, when a, a proof was presented, it's called, after the man who uh, composed it, uh, Gerdell, Gerdell's proof, that pointed out that, yes, logic does not have the answer to everything. There are some questions logic cannot touch. That if that were not so, logic would collapse. There have to be some things logic can't touch. So people get a hold of a little corner that they heard that somewhere, and so they tell you, you see, logic has limits. Yes, it has limits. But do those limits have anything to do with the questions we're talking about? That's something they haven't thought about. You see, this is like a man complaining... Uh, uh, he has a pocket calculator, and he says, look, I can only put eight digits on here. How am I supposed to keep track of my bank account? I don't need eight digits for my bank account. Probably most of us don't. A pocket calculator probably keeps track of all the money we have in the bank. So it's not a real objection to say logic has limits, but then to point out, but the questions we're talking about don't come anywhere near those limits is not an excuse. There are also those who would say, Reasoning in general, I say reasoning can be deceptive. On the one hand, if what they mean is a man who gives you an argument might deceive you, yes. I'd agree. There are th some things that sound very nice. They could fool you. But how do you keep from being fooled? You become reasonable 
you overturn the false argument by being reasonable. So the truth of the matter is, sound reasoning is not deceptive. If someone wants to insist that that is true, that a perfect argument with no fault in it can still tell you a lie, you want to ask him for proof of that. He's insisting that something is true, and if he tells you he can prove it, you want to remind him, no, no, you told me any proof can fool you, so don't tell me you can prove it. So, actually, whether a person is religious or irreligious, if he is pushing against the Muslim position on various grounds, the Muslim's response actually shows him that there are some difficulties that he hasn't faced. Because really what is done when people try to prosecute uh, the Muslim is that they only offer challenges and uh, suggestions. They're saying, well, maybe this, or couldn't it be that? They suggest things, but they don't give you an objection that stands. They make a suggestion, and you can point out that at most that is a suggestion. You haven't given me a solid thing. You've told me a thing that might be. And in most cases, I've showed you it can't be anyway. So they don't leave you with an objection so much as a, an excuse. That is, they have uh, said, well, maybe this, and that's all I need to tell you. As it happens now, when we turn around the other way, if the Muslim would prosecute his case to try to challenge people to say, what do you say of this? The Quran assures us that if we'll follow the advice given, if we bring forth the questions that are in this book, that they are going to be left without excuse. As an ayah specifically mentions, the unbelievers are without excuse. And there's many ways, uh, many things that should be brought to their attention by way of prosecution. I can sort of start where I, I finished, <laughs> in that when people normally make progress in investigating anything when they're trying to figure out a system, is a theory sensible, if it's science, medicine, whatever they're examining, they press on with their uh, reasoning, giving things thought, but if they come to something that's impossible, that is, their reasoning leads them to a contradiction, an absurdity, then they realize, well, there's something wrong with where I started then. But when you find a paradox, it means there was something wrong with what you assumed in the first place. That's how you make progress. When you reach a point where there's no sense here, then, well, something's wrong, I have to start over. I made a mistake in what I assumed. This is the method that has been around over the centuries. One famous man, 17 centuries ago, Arius, offered it as an argument. He pointed out, Divinity means immortality. So he said, you want to point to someone and say he's God and he's man? And he, his example went something like this. He said, of Jesus, if he was God, he didn't die. If he died, he wasn't God. So that in all generosity, I suppose the, the Muslim could come that far to say to uh, the Christian who would insist that Jesus is both, to say, if you want to say Jesus was God, Go ahead. But then don't tell me he died. If you want to tell me Jesus died, go ahead. But then don't tell me he was God. For today you can have either one. But certainly you can't have both. That's an old argument. Until now it doesn't have an answer. It just has a name. They named it after Arius. So that's the Arian syllogism. That doesn't make it go away. There are those who, however rejoice in the paradox. That is, when they find the impossible thing, that becomes a thing to be happy about. Another man 17 centuries ago said, it is absurd, therefore I believe it. That's how his religion worked. He said, when I reach a stupid thing, I know it's true. That's my religion. Augustine and Tertullian of the fourth century were of that frame of mind. It is absurd, Therefore, I believe it. But you see the problem that a person is in if he believes what doesn't make sense. 